Hello and welcome to Ask GMBN Tech. Now this is the show where we get to answer viewers' questions about mountain bike tech. So if you're at home and you're sitting on an absolute belter of a question about the mechanics of our mountain bikes, get in the comments using the hashtag AskGMBNTech and hopefully we can feature it on this very show. So without further ado, let's get into these questions. So the first question this week is from Tim. And he says, hi Doddy and Henry, I have two questions. Two questions, you little minx. Firstly, my reverb stealth dropper isn't returning the final inch unless I unweight my saddle to pull it up by hand. I finished bleeding and setting it to the correct pressure, but it's still happening. Does it require a full strip down service? So that's the first question, I would say so. So in the internals of a seat post such as the reverb, Certain parts have about very highly pressurized and that can burp or leak into other parts which can then give you a bit of squidge, you know, it doesn't return into full extension. So I would say it probably does need a full service. Now with the correct tools it is something you can do at home but the issue is because you're taking apart something that is charged in a way it's not meant to be from the factory there's a needle that can come out at quite a rate of knots. And at one point, a couple of years ago, it wasn't uncommon to see bike mechanics with a little cut on their forehead as they got poked in the face by this bloody needle coming out about 102 miles an hour. But um, if you send it any, you know, local suspension service center would be able to do that. And, um, you know, should get you back riding again, which is good news. And the next question is you're saying you're getting violent vibration from your fork lowers when braking. You only notice it on a tarmac or fire roads and not during woody descents. The fork is a Fox Talus with a 200mm SLX brake. So that could be for a couple of reasons. So sometimes it is just a case of the actual um, pads kind of rattling about in the caliper and it's nothing untoward and nothing to worry about. Something slightly more serious is the, the tubes of your fork will be sliding through a bush. Now the reason you want something to be, you know, minimal friction possible is obviously going to increase performance. And so it's not uncommon for racers to get their bushes reamed to a slightly bigger size to increase more warmth sensitivity. The problem is when they get worn, they get kind of slack and that can sometimes be the cause of the vibration. So what I'd suggest is actually holding the bike up on its back wheel and just bouncing it. And if your fork with the wheel in is going then um, sound effects aside, sound effects aside, I think uh, it could be the indication there's some kind of worn element to the lower. Um, the second thing I would say is um, if you can just basically, you know, do the, what you normally do for a headset um, check, turn the buzz to 90 degrees, make sure there's no rocking in the headset just to be absolutely sure. And then if you can try and inspect around the rotor and the brake pads, just to make sure there's no way that they could be vibrating around inside the caliper and of course make sure they're the correct ones as well. Um, there was a couple of years ago where on some Shimano brakes sometimes the pads would vibrate ever so slightly but you would only notice it on quite controlled settings such as on tarmac descents but like I said when you get on proper technical stuff it just gets blended in with all the other noise and whatnot going on with our bikes. So um, I hope that helps you Tim. The next question is from Mokit and they say why does my tyre wobble when the wheel is spinning, even though the rim is straight. How can I get it dead straight? Well, this is a very good question. So you might have the rim absolutely bang on true, but it could be one of two things I would normally suspect. The first is that the tire isn't seated properly. And that means that basically one side is kind of dipped in down in the well and the other side is up on the bead. Now this can give it a bit of a wobble. So what you need to do is there's normally an indicator on the tire itself, which is just a line that sits ever so slightly, maybe two or three mil higher than the rim. And that's there to tell you if it has popped onto the bead or not. Now, the second thing it could be is if you've been, you know, hitting corners hard, riding things that have, you know, large compressions in, is you can actually sometimes warp the carcass of the tire. And that means that no matter what you do, it's never really going to come back. If the tie isn't too old and you were the original owner, you can often warranty it for that problem as it is a manufacturing defect, or at least it's accepted to be. Um, so I would say explore one of those two options. It's bound to be one of them. Either it's not seated properly or the tire is a dud. If it is badly warped, you probably don't want to carry on riding it because 
you know, things could go south pretty quickly in terms of air pressure, which you might not want to happen to you. The next question is from Andreas and they say, is it bad to bottom out the suspension on your bike? This is a really good question. So you wanna be bottoming out the suspension of your bike sometimes, but not all the time. If you're hammering through the travel, you'll probably find that, you know, you're not really using the mid stroke as, as it should be. Because the, especially with a fork, if you're sitting too deep into the stroke, it's gonna really drastically, you know, increase the angles of your bike. So what you wanna be doing is basically use the travel indicator o-ring if you've got one and you know, every couple of rides i think you should bottom out but it's nice to be using most of the travel if not all of it but then just have a little a little bit for special occasions so to speak um if you are bottoming out a lot and it's a kind of relatively recent air forks or air shock on your bike you can use volume spacers which are really good at tuning the final part of your stroke to add more bottom out resistance because if you're if you're using too much of the travel too much of the time, it's not only gonna be not nice when you're bottoming out on things for either you or the suspension unit, but it, it also is gonna basically have a huge knock-on effect about how your fork or suspension unit rides dynamically. And what I mean by that is when your sag is set correctly, it it means that you know the small bump is using the appropriate amount of travel, a medium-sized hit is using the appropriate amount of travel, and a large hit is using the appropriate amount of travel. The issue is when you're bottoming out at the time, it means that you could be find you're actually lacking support where you need it, and that can generate instability, which is obviously what we don't want. The next question is from Qualentino, I hope, and um, they say, I have a six month old Canyon Strive, and when I'm putting pressure on the pedals, there is a cracking sound coming from either the bottom bracket area or the wheel air or the rear wheel area. Also, when I'm putting my fork wheel against a wall and putting pressure on the pedals, the bottom bracket flexes like five millimeters to one side. Is this flex normal? And did I just get unlucky with the bottom bracket or could this be a cause or maybe even damage to the frame? Um, so I would basically, the first thing I would do is um, degrease, clean and regrease any interfaces such as your bottom bracket, anything that can give a creak, maybe even your headset because sometimes things can manifest there in a way you wouldn't suggest. I had a really bad creak recently that actually just came from the interface of my um, of my cassette going onto the free hub. So, um, you know, just try and go methodically through the bike and make sure everything is nicely greased. You can also do things like um, hardware for your, um, your pivot bolt, etc. In regards to the second thing about the side to side movement, now this is often a bit of a hmm, an old wives tale because what happens is somebody holds the bike up this way, they put a foot on their pedal and they move the bike like that, which I, I think is what you're doing from your description, although I'm sorry if it isn't. And it looks like there's a large amount of flex in the frame, especially around the bottom bracket area. Now there's probably a small amount of flex, but the large amount of flex is actually coming from deforming tires because that's what tires are meant to do. They're meant to deform under load to give, you know, to give grip and, and traction. So more often than not, it is a bit of a Mr. No it, it's, it's not what it looks like. It's just the tires doing that and all bikes do that. And I wouldn't really worry. Um, but I would just say grease everything, put it back to normal. If you've been riding a bike for six months, listen, my bikes, generate creaks a lot faster than six months. So I'd count yourself lucky, quite frankly. So the next question is from Chris and he says, bike geometry question. That's the heading, which is a great way to preface a question on GMBN Tech. Good stuff. Why are the geo measurements not given with weight or sag applied on the bike, be it a full sus or a hardtail? Well, before reading the rest of your question, I already agree with you. Whatever you say next, I probably agree with you. <laughs> For example, wouldn't stack height, bottom bracket height, or even chainstay length measurements be affected when recommended sag is applied? Given different rear ends have different axle paths, could be applied sag, so I could applied sag, even change the overall wheelbase, especially with very slack head tubes and long travel forks? And this is getting interesting. Also, another example is an aggressive hardtail with a 150 to 170 mil fork with 20 to 30% sag applied. Now that could almost, well that's gonna be almost 40 mil length, uh, 40 mil reduction in axle to crown height. So I mean, you lay out I've got a lot of good information there and it's absolutely true. You know, when some people have a few shandies down the pub 
they'll complain about how Fabio Capello never really truly incorporated the golden generation's midfield and never got Steven Gerrard, Paul Scholes, David Beckham and Lampard working in synergy with one another. I, on the other hand, complain about bike geometry and stuff like this. I completely agree with you because you've got so many, you know, consequential effects. Like if we talk in very rough figures and we say, for instance, that the axle path of the rear wheel isn't too rearward, so it's going straight up. That means your bottom bracket height is working in pretty much inversely to that, roughly speaking, which is gonna have a massive effect on your head tube. Now this really comes into play when you take into account that a lot of shocks with the same eye to eye come with different stroke length. But if their sag is different, and say the sag point between a um, 50 mil stroke and a 55 mil stroke, once that gets into it, into the wheel travel, it probably equates to about five millimeters. Well, that is going to drastically change how the bike rides dynamically, especially as you say, when you think about how a fork rides dynamically. It's really interesting RockShot's bringing out that new alteration to the air spring to get better ride height, because what that's going to do is not, not you know, anything in terms of the performance of the fork, that's largely unchanged the way the air spring works. But what it is going to do is make the ride height higher, which keeps your head tube slacker, which is why it's a really cool thing. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's all right. I mean, I think bike geometry charts are getting better. I think the the consumer base, us, all us mountain bikers, we're getting more educated when it comes to, to geometry. Now that can manifest in a couple of different ways. For instance, I recently did that video on um, innovations in enduro, and even five or six years ago, geometry charts weren't great. But going back 10 years ago, they were so basic in terms of the information the consumer was supplied with. Now, if you look at it, some brands, I'm thinking of a Banshee geometry chart I saw recently and Transition to it, I believe, and they were even specifying effective seat tube angle at certain saddle heights, which is a huge step in the right direction. Like giving effective um, seat tube angle when there is a discrepancy, a large discrepancy between that bike's effective and actual. Well, it's gonna have a massive consequence how much post you have exposed. So at some point, it seems almost arbitrary to have an effective seat tube angle written down because it's gonna vary so much from rider to rider. Um, I think you're completely right. I think that they should give two geometry charts. They should give unsagged and sagged, and I think that would be very interesting indeed. But buy me a few shandies and I will talk about this for hours. But I imagine right now, considering you guys are probably shandy less, you're probably getting bored of me yammering on. So onto the next question from Josh. He says, hey, could you do a video or go into a bit more depth on tire inserts, please? The different types, how to install and the advantages and disadvantages. I'm gonna be building up a new 2021 meter hardtail. And I think that running one in the rear might be a really good addition to the hardtail. Well, keep your eyes peeled. That's all I'm gonna say. Um, keep your eyes peeled on GMBN actually. I think there might be something going out on there. Um, yes absolutely great to experiment with. I'm still toing and throwing, um, and it's actually on a sh my shorter travel trail bike, similar it sounds like to your hardtail. And it's got such aggressive angles and it rides so well that I'm finding I have to on an insert when actually on a longer travel bike, I don't because it's a bit more forgiving in terms of the suspension. Um, so yeah, they're great. I mean, the, the big advantage is obviously rim protection for me. People do talk about stability in the in the kind of carcass of the tire, but for me, it, it's the big time is rim protection and um, and stops all the, the associated damage to tires. Um, in terms of fitting tire inserts, a really good thing to do is that um, indication mark on the tire that can show you whether your tire is seated. I find that when, once you get one side of the tire on, you put the insert in, you need to make sure that that part is, you know, the bead is right down, down in the well, so you can't actually see that indication mark, because you, the closer you can get that bead to being deep into the tire well, the more slack it's gonna give you on the other side. My other advice, piece of advice, would be to use either a big beefy cable tie, or better yet, a toe strap from an old pedal, because that's just reusable. And once you get the first part on, absolutely crank that strap to God knows what to make sure it's very, very tight. And what that would be doing is holding the tire secure in one place. So as you go around, it's not constantly just, you know, lifting off, which can be quite infuriating. 
with a bit of technique and with a bit of practice, you can make getting them on and off, you know, minutes when at the start it might be not minutes, the, the other one, the bigger one. And that's it for another week's Ask GMBN Tech. Thank you to everyone who took the time to comment on last week's video and ask some questions. Now, hopefully we can get some more absolute belting questions next week, but that relies on you a bit as well, guys. So get in the comments. What do you want to know about mountain bike tech using the hashtag Ask GMBN Tech and hopefully we can get them answered. Thank you very much for watching. Don't forget to like the video. And if you would consider subscribing, that would be just fantastic. Thanks guys, and we'll see you next time.